Greetings, all. This is Rick Levine with your November astrological forecast. And boy, all I got to say is we're, we're in for a ride. We all know that. We've been following this for months, actually, even for years on some level. But astrologically, we've been following it for, uh, for, for, for months. Um, for those of you who watched my mid-month update for October. You know that I covered up through the beginning of November. Some of that will be repeated slightly today. I'll try to take a little bit of a different slant on it so it's not just uh, repetition. Uh, But I want to make sure that we understand a couple of things. Number one, the uh, eclipse, the uh, total lunar eclipse on November 8th, is far and away the most important event of the month. Now, as such, although I'm going to do the forecast for the whole month, the events on November 8th, for a number of reasons that we'll look at astrologically, are um, are going to be a surprise no matter what the results of the election um, are in the United States. And accordingly, the second part of the month will take a slightly different turn, depending upon what happens um, on on November eighth. Now, I'm um, as always. I'm going to be doing a mid month update. But for those of you who last month in October received the October mid month update um, because I distributed it publicly. That's going back to regular. That's only going to be for my Patreon um, uh, subscribers. So if you're interested in getting the November mid month update, please go to patreon.com slash Rick Levine. And even if you only want it for a month or two for these kind of intense this intense month and the next couple of months, that's fine. You're welcome to subscribe and unsubscribe anytime you want. Um, But the fact is that the uh, November mid-month update will only be going out to Patreon subscribers. And of course, thank you to all of you who do support me on Patreon. It really does make a difference and it allows me to put in the time, effort, and research that it takes to do these um, and other video events that I'm doing. Okay, so <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Um, I think where I begin is um, is is talking about the I Ching for a moment. Now, the the I Ching, for those of you who know, uh, the Chinese Book of Changes, is not astrological, but it is a tool of divination uh, from from China, and it's about subtle and powerful changes in time. And for those of you who have dug into the I Ching, um, I am going to just spend a moment or two talking about hexagram 28. There are 64 hexagrams in the I Ching, and each of them represent a different moment um, in time, how time changes from one thing to another, because as we know, time always changes. And of course, astrology is a um, magnificent tool for understanding the changing of time. In the I Ching, there are images or symbols for each of the different, um, uh, of the 64 hexagrams. And in the old traditional I Ching, the hexagram 28 is, is an image of a bridge that is, that is sagging under the pressure and under the weight. And the, and the declaration of the um, hexagram in hexagram 28 is the ridge pole, that's the thing that holds the bridge up, sags to the breaking point. It furthers the great man to have somewhere to go. Now, this is kind of uh, encouched uh, in uh, Chinese imagery, but, but it really is... Um, about something is going to change and change dramatically. Something's going to either collapse under its own weight. There's um, um, the Divination Foundation um, has a uh, really nice take on the I Ching, and you can look up each and every one of the hexagrams. And, um, and they say for hexagram 28 is excessive pressure. 
and it says, something is about to collapse, a great pressure is causing an imbalance that needs correction. Um, And it goes on to say that if a dam is going to burst, you're going to get out of the way. You know, if you're in an old mine shaft and you feel the earth begin to, you know, tremble, you're going to get the hell out of there really quickly. And the idea here is that extraordinary times bring out the best and the worst in people. And, um, and, And yet, extraordinary times when there is this kind of great pressure cannot last. And in fact, once something happens, that's what we have to live with. Um, I talked about this in the October mid-month um, update, and uh, and in a way, I'm going to try to paint a slightly different picture. Well, I'm going to try to paint the same energetic picture, but from a slightly different point of view, so that you, we can better understand why November is such a critical um, moment um, in the history of the planet. And remember, although I am coming at this from a point of view of the United States and Election Day being um, uh, nine days away, I'm recording this on Hollow Eve, on Halloween, on October 31st in the evening, um, and, um, and we've had events around the world that are all aiming at the same thing the United States is dealing with, uh, the following Tuesday, Tuesday, November 8th on election day. And that is a temporary or temporal resolution of the pressure that has built and continues to build that needs some sort of resolution. Now, resolution doesn't mean solution. It just means that the pressure needs to be eased so we can go on. But again, this is not just a USA issue. Um, Obviously, Great Britain is feeling the fallout of uh, leaving um, uh, the European community of Brexit and having their leadership um, in crisis not only a change in the royal family, but a, um, a very rapid succession of prime ministers. Uh, Brazil just re-elected a um, previous president, uh, Bolsonaro, um, uh, lost at the polls. And what that'll do, Bolsonaro, is uh, um, a Trump-like character. Um, and, um, and the fact that the left candidate there uh, one is is of interest. Um, obviously, we have a social revolution in Iran um, with uh, women uh, f- standing up for their rights to actually be seen. Um, and we have issues going on all over the world, uh, it, you know, nation by nation. Obviously, in Russia, there is a battle for control of Russia, and obviously there is a war in the U- in Ukraine, and um, and and we can go on and on and on and on. The best way to understand what's going on now is to take a very quick journey back in the time machine to the mid-1960s, when the planets Uranus and Pluto were aligned with Saturn in opposition to them. And of course, this period of time stands out in the 20th century as a time of of incredible um, social change. And, and upheaval, and Uranus, the planet of shock, surprise, awe, revolution, Uranus, the planet of ingenious breakthrough of invention, um, it's the progressive futuristic planet, it's the technology planet aligned with Pluto, the planet of, of the deepest urges, of the hell realms, of the unconscious, of the bacchanalian drive um, for, for uh, uh, survival and pleasure even, Um, The lineup of these two planets in the mid-60s 
with with stabilizing Saturn in opposition was certainly a significant period of time. Why are we talking about that? Because that was the seed period, like every new moon is a seed period for the next lunar cycle, every conjunction of um, of the of the slow moving planets Uranus and Pluto um, act as kind of like a seed period for a, a a great cycle that's a century and a half or so long. Now, in twenty twelve to twenty fifteen, Uranus was ninety degrees or square to Pluto, and we saw many of the um, events and um, and issues of social change that were uh, that that dominated the 1960s, we saw them again dominating the news. And it's not like any of those issues actually went away. It's just that they weren't in the news in such a um, uh, kind of in our face day in and day out as as issues of urgency, um, and I'm talking about issues of the '60s like um, like the um, feminist movement, uh, the founding of Ms. Magazine, and the Burn Your Bra, and the um, and and the uh, um, women's rights, birth control that actually came. Um, or led to um, Roe v. Wade, that kind of was a culmination of that issue. There was a use of um, uh, social use of uh, mind-altering drugs, including psychedelics and marijuana. Um, and in the 2012 to 2015, um, these issues again were back in our face. Um, uh, Earth Day and environmentalism began in the late 60s, early 70s in that period of time, and again was back in our face. We had um, student revolutions um, and uh, people being arrested for standing up against the, uh, the wealthy, the power structure. And again, in the 2012 to 2015, we had uprisings um, um, in uh, a lot of the Arab countries. We had Arab Spring. We had uh, in Egypt, in fact, we had an Occupy Wall Street. People all over were, were standing up again. We had civil rights in the 60s that were kind of driving what eventually um, uh, culminated in the Civil Rights Act. Um, but again, in that 2012 to 2015, we were confronted day in and day out by those issues. Um, and theoretically, at the square, the 90-degree angle between um, Uranus and Pluto, this would take those issues that began back in the 60s at the conjunction and would remind us which ones were important and were going to continue to develop and which ones might fall away. The thing, though, is that just because the Uranus-Pluto square, which was exact seven times because of the retrograde motion, between 2012 and 2015, even as that square began to widen, it wasn't really quite over because we had right on its tail, we had Saturn sweeping through this area of sky where it first conjoined Pluto, and that was in um, January of 2020, um, and, and Jupiter was in the picture then also conjoining Pluto, and of course 2020 was the year not only of, um, of, of, of COVID and of the um, pandemic of fear of which COVID was a major symptom that shut down, pretty much shut down most of the planet, but also that was the year where once again the social issues of um, of, of uh, su white supremacy and or uh, Black Lives Mattering, George Floyd, were back in our face again, um, and the realization that these issues have not only not gone away, they may have actually suddenly got become worse. It's just that now with video cameras, we're seeing them day in and day out, and again being 
confronted by them. So this is all now part of that same scenario, but here from an astrological point of view is why this is so significant. And that is that the square of Uranus and Pluto from 2012 to 2015 that really lasted pretty much all the way up to 2020. I mean, it's, these, these slow-moving squares are, are a decade or so long. And for those of you who want to track some of these in a historical basis, um, the book to read is Cosmos and Psyche by um, Rick Tarnas, by Richard Tarnas. This is the encyclopedia of this astrology that I'm talking about from a, an overview sweep of, uh, of, of history. But the reason why that event or, or the, the um, events associated with the Uranus-Pluto squares of 2012 to 2015, or let's even say 2010 to 2020, why they are not over until election day of this year is because that as Saturn is the crystallizing function, back in the 60s, Saturn was in opposition to the Uranus-Pluto square. And although the square between Uranus and Pluto, 2012 to 2015, um, was exact during those dates, it wasn't until Saturn swept through Capricorn and contacted Pluto by, by conjunction, along with Jupiter, but then it's not until the square to Saturn was complete that kind of completes the energy of the old, uh, say old of the 2012 to 2015, um, Pluto, um, Uranus-Pluto square. So we have Uranus-Pluto square and Saturn is sweeping through and it's not until Saturn finishes it's square to Uranus. Now, on paper, it looks like that happened in 2021 because, as we know, Uranus squared uh, was squared by, by Saturn three times in 2021. But as we also know, and as I've been talking about, and many astrologers have been talking about, that Uran the, the Saturn-Uranus square came back within almost a half a degree of being exact um, by the beginning of October. And, and this eclipse on November 8th is a, is a lunar eclipse with the eclipsed moon conjuncting Uranus and squaring Saturn. And this is the actual turning point finality. If a dam is going to break, this is when the dam will break. If the, um, if the earth is going to quake, this is when the earth will quake. However, this is not a bad moment. It's simply a dramatic moment where um, things can shift. And it's really important that we understand that astrologically things don't happen to us. Things happen with our participation. And for that reason, I'm going to suggest that at least here in the United States, it's really significant that we take part whether or not we're committed uh, to the process um, of um, voting for one ticket or another given um, two choices, that the fact here is that there may be lesser of two evils that we need to um, show up for because the gulf is so wide and the result of what happens um, it will be quite significant. Now, unfortunately, I know as soon as I talk about this, I'm either losing people um, or, or people are upset because they're on one side of this spectrum or another. Other. And all I can say um, is that that it's difficult or impossible for me to show up in these times of great change as an astrologer who is supposed to be offering my perspective on what's going on without actually observing what's going on. So enough said there for now, um, except um, we just need to stand back a little bit as we move through the first part of November, um, because whatever happens on November 8th is not going to um, solve any issues. It's simply going to resolve some of the tension 
again, temporarily, because these issues are not going to go away. And it's important that we understand that humanity has gone through some very, very, very dark periods and some very exciting and, and, and light and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, breakthrough, inventive, uh, social change periods. Wherever we move through this first week of November, we still need to show up, we still need to be part of our community, and life will go on one way or another, regardless of whether your beliefs have been supported or not. The thing here, though, to understand is that it's like heating up two metals. Um, I used this illusion um, or this image earlier when copper is a very moldable and bendable metal. Um, so bendable that it's not good for implements of war because you can't make a sword out of copper because it bends and it doesn't hold an edge like steel does. Tin is much of the same way. You know, tin is really great because you can bend it and you can work with it. But when you melt tin and copper together and then you let it cure in a particular shape, the shape that it cures in cannot be remelted down and changed because it creates what's called an alloy. And, um, and, and bronze is the result of melting tin with copper. And I just want to suggest that what's going on in November is that the alloy will be cooling, that whatever shape the alloy is in as it begins to cool, that's going to be the shape that we're going to have to live with for a while. And for some people, it's going to be very exciting because it's the shape that that they were hoping for and wanting. And for other people, it might be very disappointing. And yet that's just going to be the lay of the land for, for, for a bit. And again, it's not permanent, but these are, but the alloy is not going to be able to be remelted and undone to be to be redone. The fact that Saturn and Uranus are now separating, and they separate rather dramatically and quickly, is very, very significant. But until now, it's like it hasn't quite been a done deal. It's, it, it, it's like there was some notice that things were beginning to change, that, that there, there's been some shifts in our perception of what reality is, um, and there's been some awareness put to what actually happened during the um, square of um, of Uranus and Pluto, and then the subsequent conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter to Pluto in 2020. So when we look at, um, at, at the Saturn-Uranus square, and we go back to uh, August, they were about four degrees of, away from being exactly square. And by the beginning of September, they were one and a half degrees. So they were almost back to being square. And by October 1st, just a month ago from when I'm recording this, um, on October 1st, they were um, 0.6 degrees, just a, a little bit over a half a degree from being exactly square again. And now on November 1st, they're about a degree and a half. That's still tightly within orb, but, it, but, the, but it's, it's separating. And then by the end of November, they're four degrees apart, and they don't ever come back this close, at least in this particular cycle. So I think what we're going to see in November is, is, is a um, going back to that, that image of the pressure on the bridge um, or on the dam, where wh the pressure isn't going to lighten up until the month progresses. And I think that there are some things in this month that are very intriguing, um, aside from the eclipse, 
Um, we also have uh, Jupiter um, this month turning stationary direct. Um, the planets had kind of been stacked up retrograde, and and um, and Jupiter turns direct this month. Of course, Mars um, is retrograde. Mars turned um, retrograde on the 30th, and Mars is stays retrograde all the way through January. We're going to talk about the importance of that in just a moment also. But but what I want to talk about here, just um, again for, for a, a bit, is this idea that the Saturn square Uranus reaches its height during the eclipse on the morning of November 8th. And, and yet there are some other things that are cooking there that are certainly part of that eclipse. And let's uh, dig into some uh, charts. So we look at the chart for November 1st, and we can see already that T-square, which is kind of why the T-square is when there are three points on a grand four-pointed square in the sky, <clears throat> and we have planets in the fixed sign of Scorpio, opposite Uranus and the North Node um, in the fixed sign of Taurus, and they're being squared by Saturn in the fixed sign of Aquarius. And on November 1st, by midday, the moon is sweeping through mid-Aquarius. And so we're getting some of that stress and tension that's going to be back in our face in a week when the moon moves a quarter of the way around the circle and is lining up with Uranus in one week on Election Day. Astrologically, aside from the planets grouped in Scorpio at the beginning of the month and Jupiter having just retrograded back into Pisces and Jupiter stays in Pisces all month, which is kind of giving us a little bit of rear view mirrorism a bit. Rear view mirrorism is driving ahead in the car by looking in the rear view mirror and seeing where you've been. So we have some of that looking back still going on. And that's, of course, doubled down by the fact that Mars also is um, retrograde. And throughout the month, Mars will be repeating some important aspects um, that it made back in September. And we'll be talking about those in a couple of minutes also. But as we move on uh, the beginning of November, the, um, the first few days are relatively quiet. Um, on November 2nd, the sun makes a square and a half with retrograde Mars, um, that there, there's, you know, fighting words. There's some assertion, aggression, but geez, we got plenty of that going on all over right now. So that's not a surprise by any sense of the imagination. Um, that's November 2nd. Um, on the 3rd and 4th, we have several um, uh, sesqui squares. These are squares and a half. Um, 90 degree is a square, 135 degrees is a square and a half a square added together. Um, and basically what happens during these days is that Mercury and Venus um, move through making these squares and a half um, with Neptune, Jupiter, and Mars, and they create dissonance, they create irritation, they create anxiety. And, um, and that's really the undertone of what we're feeling is we're feeling this, this acute um, anxiety that just doesn't want to go away. Um, and that's even exacerbated by the fact that on November 1st, Venus formed a quincunx with Chiron, um, which also basically says um, it, it, it's, it makes healing difficult. Um, Venus, um, uh, the planet of attraction, Chiron, the planet of learning things that have to do with healing our emotions often, um, that it makes it almost like we don't want to learn. We have resistance. And by November 5th, the sun moves into that same 13 degree point where Venus was on the first of the month, which makes a quincunx with Chiron, um, and Chiron is retrograde, um, and you can see that on noon, Chiron is um, back to 12 degrees, but they're very, very close to that exact 
quincunx or five-twelfths of a circle, an aspect of annoyance or irritation. And in fact, on the fifth, the moon moving through Aries is going through that exact same position lining up with Chiron. And again, these days leading up to election day are not easy. There, There's a lot of there's there's a lot of arguing and irritation and and blaming and and almost like an I'm not going to change my mind I'm going to I'd rather blame it on someone else that seems to be the the call during this period of time even as we get to November 6th now the sun makes its exact square and a half with Jupiter um and on the 6th we also have Venus making um, a square with Saturn. This is going to be important as we look at the actual November 8th um, election chart, election day chart, because of the squares that are being made to Saturn by Venus, the Sun, and Mercury on one side, and by um, Uranus on, on the other side. So, um, so this square to Saturn um, from, from Venus, again, we're not feeling okay. Matter of fact, this can be disillusioning and discouraging enough that we just feel like I'm not going to play. Um, on November 6th, you might finally say, you know what? Voting isn't worth it. I'm not going to vote. All I can say is get through that November 6th because it's not an acceptable answer. Otherwise, we get the course of least resistance um, and we um, lose things like um, a, a woman's right to uh, um, choose what goes on within her own body. Um, and I get that there's larger issues here that are very complicated about choosing one owns, one's own body and medical freedom and so on. This is not a simple um, this is not a simple situation. This is as complicated as the chart is. That's all I got to say. So on November 6th, um, again, with that sun making a square and a half to Jupiter, it, it's like the events seem very loud. Um, it's almost like it's I I exaggeration becomes the call of the day. Everyone's overstating their case. Everyone's exaggerating. And it makes it really difficult to figure out what the heck is really, really going on. Um, in fact, by November 7th, we now have Mercury coming in and making its square and a half to Jupiter. So these planets are coming through and making the same aspect one after another. And in fact, we're going to see this as a theme all month where Venus, Sun, and Mercury, although they'll switch positions, um, as the three of them make an aspect um, to Saturn, to Neptune, to Jupiter, to Chiron, um, and, and to um, Uranus. And so we're seeing that with these sesqui squares right now and this sense of irritation that largely um, is going to come to a head on November 8th. And on November 8th, the eclipse itself takes place at 3.02 a.m. Pacific time. That's 6.02 a.m. just before polls are opening um, on the east coast um, of the United States. And we have the sun at, um, at exactly 16 degrees of Scorpio opposite the moon at, at 16 degrees of Taurus. Um, we have Uranus at 16 degrees of Taurus. And we have Mercury at 15 degrees of Scorpio, but that's in 52 minutes. It's only eight minutes away from being exactly um, joined up with the sun. And in fact, um, those aspects all fall exactly through the 8th and the 9th. Um, um, the Mercury opposition Uranus um, is uh, later in the day in the evening on November 8th. The sun's opposition to Uranus is on the 9th. Um, Mercury square to Saturn is on the 9th. Um, oh, we forgot um, Mercury's uh, um, alignment with um, the sun um, is just a few hours after the eclipse, um, also on the morning of November 8th. And so what we're looking here and what we're looking at here is Mercury Sun communication. Mercury in the heart of the Sun, basically that Mercury becomes powerful in Scorpio. It has a perspective. It has a point of view. It's not backing away from it. It may have some secrets about that perspective. It may not be saying everything it knows. 
and its opposite, the moon being eclipsed in front of um, Uranus, which is the planet of unpredictable quantum um, events that that you can't tell what happens until it happens. I, I look at Uranian events a lot like lightning strikes, a lot like how lightning strikes. If you're a photographer and ever tried to capture a picture of lightning, or for that matter, of a fish jumping, you know, it's like, you know, they're jumping, you know, you can see them. Oh, there's one. But by the time you aim the camera at it, it's jumping somewhere else. The same thing with lightning. You know that there's a lightning storm going on, but you don't know when and you don't know where and you don't know with what intensity the lightning is going to strike. This is a bit like that Uranus um, um, behind the eclipsed moon. Um, It's like lightning is striking, but it's hard to tell what's happening um, until it already happened. Now, here's the thing. Again, Uranus is the planet of progressiveness, of change, of futuristic. Um, It's the planet of rebellion. It's the planet of, um, um, of, of, of questioning authority and turning it over. But it's square to Saturn, and Saturn is authority. Saturn is the status quo. And as each of these planets... Um, first, like the moon, line up with, or like um, Venus, the sun, and Mercury oppose Uranus, as they do that, they're also going to square Saturn. And so Mercury squares Saturn on the 9th, the sun squares Saturn on the 10th, um, and um, and the um, Venus squared Saturn a few days ago. That was, I think we already talked about that. That was on the sixth, I believe. Yeah, that was on the that was on the sixth. And so, so what happens is that the same dance between the old and the new, between the break free and the being under the thumb of the rulers. Um, this is what's going on now. Behind all of this, there is another piece of this puzzle, and that is that retrograde Mars um, is coming back toward a retrograde uh, square to Neptune. Mars right now on Election Day is at 25 degrees of, um, of Gemini. And Mars actually moved direct through Gemini, and Mars squared... Um, Neptune on October 11th. Mars will continue to retrograde and it will square Neptune again on November 19th, just a couple of weeks from, um, yeah, um, a little bit over a week from Election Day. And then it will back all the way up, turn direct in January, and it will square that um, that uh, Neptune a third and final time um, in mid-March of next year. When Mars is squaring Neptune, it's hard to tell what's going on. And this is kind of an event normally when Mars makes an aspect to Neptune or to any planet, it lasts a few days and that's it. But because of this retrograde, Mars is holding its position, making it even more complicated to know what's going on. Granted, we've had the issue of um, media distortion, fake news, um, um, uh, the big lie, whatever whatever you want to call it. People, you know, um, seeing people storming a capital with guns and weapons and people being killed and people saying, oh, no, it's a peaceful demonstration. I mean, we see different things. And especially with this Mars squaring Neptune, that becomes perpetuated even more. And and so that is sitting behind the events here on Election Day. Also, with Mars retrograde, it makes it even more confusing because that Mars retrograde is, in fact, squaring Neptune. Mars is also um, coming into a quincunx with Pluto, and it never reaches that quincunx. In other words, it was Mars was moving direct, and it went through 23 and 24, and then it reached 25 degrees of Gemini just a few days ago, um, and, and, and then it stopped. 
or apparently stopped to retrograde, and, and it never reached the 26-degree point of Gemini to make that exact quincunx with Pluto, and so it might feel like we're not getting resolution, like it doesn't matter where we scratch the itch, it's still itches. And I think that that's the annoying thing about that Mars uh, quincunx to, um, to Pluto. One other thing that's occurring during this, um, during this eclipse that I think is, it, two other things that I think is important, is that all those planets in Scorpio, one by one, um, as they move towards latter degrees of Scorpio, Venus first, will we'll form a trine with Neptune, then a trine with, um, with Jupiter. And um, the Venus trine, Neptune, is, is, is actually the, the first of them, and that occurs on um, the 10th. And we're going to talk about these rhythms of first Venus trining um, Neptune on, um, on the 10th, and then Mercury on the 12th, and then the Sun on the 14th, and we're going to get these kind of um, beautiful visions, or something nice comes out of all of this, because that trine in some way um, kind of reinforces the energy rather than blocks it like, like the squares can. So what's going to happen on Election Day so, so we can move on? I don't know. And in fact, anyone who says they know doesn't know. This, I know, is a common theme of mine. But with Uranus and Saturn coming into this last kind of major pattern with, um, with one, two, three, four, five, six planets involved in this kind of eclipsing uh, T-square, it's like this is the culminating point of the ongoing, not only Saturn square Uranus, but in fact, going back to the Uranus square Pluto, because again, if we sweep that Saturn backward, when it was joining up with, um, with Pluto back in early 2020, this is still tied to that. And in some ways, this is the thing that pushes us through it. And once we're through this, once election day is over, as we move on, um, and it's not going to happen right away, it's going to happen with twists and turns and steps forward and backward, but we're going to be moving away from whatever this was that we've been going through, I think pretty quickly. And by the end of the month, I think that we will really feel like we're standing on new ground, wherever that ground may, may be. All right. So um, on the day after the eclipse, that's when the sun makes its exact opposition um, with, with Uranus. And again, remember here that, um, that Uranus is the planet of, um, of, of, of not doing what, what is expected. Uranus is the planet of breaking free from, from, from the restraints, breaking free um, from those things which held us back. And the fact that this is still going on on November 9th after the eclipse, I think is important. But then the squares begin. And remember, I said that we have these ongoing waves. Well, we have Venus we, we had Venus square Saturn on November 6th, Mercury square Saturn on the 9th, and then the Sun square Saturn on the 11th. These are all reality checks. These are all like, like kind of demystifying whatever it is that happened. It's, it's disillusioning. It's taking the illusion away. Um, and, and that's going to be an important process on the days after Election Day. Um, interestingly enough, we have this juxtaposition of planets making squares with Saturn and trines with Neptune kind of interlaced with one another. And so we get both the, the uh, um, fantasy fed and the reality kind of, of, of stepping in. So on the 10th, we get Venus trine Neptune. 
This is the uh, Venus and Neptune. This is romance. This is beauty. What can it be that's beautiful that pops up in all of this? There's something sweet. There's something that works in all of this. And then um, that's on the, the 10th, Venus trines Neptune. Of course, the sun square Saturn. So we're still on this billiard ball, not billiard ball, pinball, you know, where we're being bounced back and forth. But by the 12th, Mercury trines Neptune. And here we have some smoothness of, um, of, of, of dreams, of fantasies, of visions. And we also have the moon moving through Cancer. This is a grand water trine with the moon and Cancer moving through trines to the sun, Mercury, and Venus, which are in turn moving through trines to first um, Neptune and then later on in the month to, to Jupiter. Um, on the 13th, we have Venus making a sextile with, um, with, with Pluto. Now, this is a deepening of energies that we've had a lot of squares um, going back through October um, to, to Pluto that have been difficult, things coming out in the open that have been hard to, to, to integrate. But now with Venus making that trine, I'm sorry, with Venus making that sextile to Pluto, um, it's the first um, uh, of, again, the three of them, because Venus makes the sextile to Pluto on the 13th, Mercury makes it on the 14th, and the Sun makes it on the 18th, and each of these, in a way, are unfolding the, the, the secrets, but in a way that becomes more palatable. It becomes more easily um, integratable, is that a word? More easy to integrate. And I think that this is significant. Through the middle of, of November, um, we, we still have some of these kind of annoying quincunxes um, happening. Um, uh, Venus to Mars on the 11th, Mercury to Mars on the 13th. Um, uh, the semi square or sesqui squares are still occurring um, to. Um, Chiron, Venus on the 14th, um, Mercury on the 15th, and then um, the Sun um, um, on the 19th. These are all still stressful, but behind that we have some stuff that we're working with. And these trines in particular um, that I think culminate with the um, suns, remember all of these planets are first making trines to Neptune, but then they pick up on trines to Jupiter. And those trines to Jupiter, I think, are expansive. They're opportunistic. Um, and in some ways, they're, they're easier to take because it feels like where it feels like we have something in front of us that we're working toward, that we're going to. And the three trines to Jupiter are Venus trining Jupiter on the 15th, Mercury trining Jupiter on the 16th, and then the Sun trining Jupiter, which I think is the culmination on the 20th. And that Sun trining Jupiter on the 20th is not only a culmination of those planets trining Jupiter. Remember, Jupiter is the planet of Sagittarius. Jupiter is at home in Pisces and Sagittarius. They're all trining Jupiter while Jupiter is in Pisces. But then, one at a time, each of those planets moves um, from Scorpio into Sagittarius, and that kind of takes us to the next, you know, to to the next level with all of this. Um, what happens is that the first planet that moves into Sagittarius um, is um, Venus on the 16th, then Mercury on the 17th, and then the Sun moves into Sagittarius on the 22nd. And that shift of planets moving into Sagittarius um, is basically the vision widens. We begin to see a larger scenario. Now, the moon is still hanging back in Scorpio on the 22nd, um, and, and that's a Tuesday. And what's interesting is that by Thanksgiving, which is Thursday the 24th, remember Thanksgiving, which I understand is not necessarily Although we can give thanks, we may want to pay attention to what we're giving thanks for, um, because as we know, um, the indigenous peoples of North America 
don't refer to this holiday as Thanksgiving. Um, for them, it's a day of sorrow, a day of mourning, a day of tears um, because of what that led um, for the indigenous peoples of this of this country. If we can keep that in perspective, there's still a sense of Sagittarius um, open heart. Um, we can still celebrate on that day, but celebrating perhaps the potential of what's ahead of us, because that's what Sagittarius likes to do. Sagittarius wants to look forward and see the adventure, see the potential, see the possibility. And I find it intriguing that this year, that the new moon um, in Sagittarius actually falls on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving. Um, I think we could even call this um, perhaps Thanksgiving Eve, <laughs> um, when the, um, the, the moon um, at one degree, one and a half degrees of Sagittarius, the moon moves into Sagittarius, um, and then it catches up with the sun uh, at 2.57 p.m., and that's Pacific Standard Time, Pacific Time. Um, and we also have Venus and Mercury um, also um, making their um, uh, move through Sagittarius. They're moving very closely together, um, and so there is a connection between what we say and and what we like here, in effect. And, um, and that new moon, I think, is very important because... It's aiming us into the future. It's showing us what's ahead rather than, um, rather than what's behind. Um, it, it's showing us ahead. It, it's showing us um, what's, um, w- what the potential is rather than what we've had to deal with in the past. And, and again, this new moon is still really trining Jupiter. It's only a degree and a half, two degrees away from the trine that's separating um, from that trine to Jupiter. Um, But Venus and Mercury are now trining or coming into a trine with Chiron. And these, again, remember all the planets one at a time are going to go bing, bing, bing. Now we have Mercury ahead of the pack. Mercury makes um, makes the trine to Chiron um, on November 24th, um, Venus makes the trine to Chiron on the 25th, and then the sun will make the trine, trine to Chiron off the first week of December. Um, and, and, and this is the healing that we couldn't get earlier. This is a shot at that healing. And so I think there's real potential toward the end of the month for, um, for the healing that perhaps has been escaping us um, toward toward the beginning of the month. Remember, Sagittarius, um, the archer, is aiming the arrow, um, a thought, a hope, a wish, a desire, into the sky. And it's not about hitting the target. It's about releasing the intention so it can all so it ha- so it can go to where it's going. As long as we are holding on to the past, we're not going to be able to get into the future. Um, I know there have been times before where I've mentioned uh, the book Zen and the Art of Archery. Um, this is not a book about how to become a better archer. Well, it may be on some level, but it's really a book about how. Um, in order to hit a target, you have to release the arrow. And in Zen, the concept is, as long as we're holding on the idea of, I don't want to think about things, I don't want to think about things, I don't want things to get in the way of my clear mind, as long as I'm thinking about it, it's not going to happen. I have to let go. I have to release the wish. Um, it's like blowing out the candle on the birthday to, you know, um, after one blowing out the candles on the cake, or at any ritual, one has to release the intention. So Sagittarius is the time of year when we actually get to release those intentions that we've been holding on to in Scorpio, maybe for fear of how intense it's going to be or how intense it is. But as we hit that new moon in Sagittarius, I think we really begin to open to the future. So I'm seeing hope here, and and I'm seeing hope and potential um, uh, again, that's independent of a particular um, race or 
call on American on, on the American Election Day, um, and and although I think that 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 actually can change the how we work with the trajectory, energetically it's still the same. Um, Oh, before I go on, I wanted to go back to um, to the um, election day eclipse because there was one thing um, that I didn't say that I wanted to make sure um, I covered, um, and that is that, as many of you know, I use quintiles and septiles. Um, quintiles a division of a circle by five, like a five-pointed star, um, and septiles by seven, a seven-pointed star. Quintiles are magical. They're beautiful. They're related to the Venus star, which we just had the superior con- conjunction um, of Venus to the sun, which marks one of the points on a five-pointed star that Venus makes as as it joins up with Earth, as it conjoins Earth from a solar or heliocentric perspective. Venus joins up with Earth five times in eight years, and it does that making a grand five-pointed star in the sky because of the mathematical relationship between Venus and Earth that actually creates the quintiles, which is one-fifth of a circle. I'll go into this much further um, in the spring. I'm going to be doing a course through Astrology Hub on aspects where I'm going to really dig into the quintiles and septiles. I don't want to go much further into them now other than to note that there is a direct relationship between the love, the beauty, the magic, um, the creative energy of Venus and quintiles. And that if we looked at the um, at the total lunar eclipse and took out all the regular aspect and just put in the quintiles, the Sun and Mercury, Pluto, Chiron, and Mars would mark off pretty closely four out of five points on a grand five-pointed star. Um, the missing point is, I think, right here. It's, a, it's, a, it's early Virgo. It's about, about five or six degrees of, of Virgo is the, missing, um, is the missing point on this. Now, this as a configuration is incredibly powerful. Um, you see it in charts like Leonardo da Vinci had um, what I call a quintile bowl. Um, in other words, if you turned this around, it would look like a bowl with, um, you know, again, four out of five points on a five-pointed star. You see this also in charts of um, poets. Um, the poet, poet critic Robert Bly um, had this same type of um, uh, configuration. Um, I think that this bodes well, except there is a downside to quintiles, and that is when the beauty doesn't get to express easily, sometimes it gets bottled up and it expresses more violently. Um, and in fact, you see strong quintile patterns in, in charts like Mar- Marquis de Sade and, and, and Adolf Hitler. Um, so this is neither good nor bad in totality, but I find it in, incredibly unique. I don't know that I've ever seen an eclipse with so much going on, including um, this um, um, quintile bowl, um, which has the Mercury-Sun um, conjunction um, at the opposite midpoint to the Mars and Chiron, um, it's, um, it becomes a very, very intriguing symmetrical pattern. So I think that this Sagittarius new moon is as important a new moon as I've seen in a while because it really, it, it, it commands us. It, it, um, that's not the right word. It inspires us to look off into the distance. And it's not that we're unconcerned about what happens today or tonight or tomorrow but we're now looking off into the distance and we're seeing something in the future that's more important, something that we're heading toward. And I think that there's a, um, a high level of um, dreaminess, of, of, of hope involved here. But I have to say 
that it's important that we remember we're just coming off the second of three Mars square Neptunes, that Mars square Neptune um, is exact or was exact for the second of three times um, on um, on November 19th. And so by the 23rd, we're, we're, we're getting um, that again. And, and what this means again is that it's easy to get lost in what's not the main event. It's easy to get lost in the illusion rather than, um, than where we really need to be focused. Um, now, we also see something else beginning to cook here, and that is that as Mars is retrograding backward, um, on the 23rd, it's at 21 and a half degrees um, of Gemini, and Saturn is at 19 and a half degrees of Aquarius. So Mars is backing into a trine. And again, this becomes another um, example of um, the uh, three aspects that Mars will make to several planets. In fact, on, um, on, the, um, on the 20th, um, we have the moon moving through Libra, making a trine with Saturn on one side and then a trine with, um, with Mars on the other. And, and this brings up something that I think is an interesting um, point or question. And um, when Jeff Jower was alive and he and I did a lot of astrology events and teaching together, um, including these um, m- a month uh, for- monthly forecasts, the question always was, what happens when good planets make bad aspects or when bad planets make good aspects? Now, for those of you who know me and know my work, I don't believe that, that a planet's bad. I don't think Saturn and Mars, which are called the malefics, I don't think they're bad. They're just sometimes more difficult to work with. They're maybe more unforgiving. Um, whereas Venus and Jupiter, I wouldn't say that those planets are good. They can be disastrous, but often they're easier to assimilate or work with, and they're called the benefics. So the question here is, since a trine is a smooth flowing of energy between the two planets, what happens when malefic Mars makes a trine with malefic Saturn even supported by by the moon in all of this. Does it increase their difficulty because they're working together, or does it give them a positive twist? Now, here, traditional astrology and modern astrology differs. We'll have to wait and see how this unfolds. But again, each of these aspects that Mars is making to the slower-moving planets happens three times. And the first time that Mars made that trine to Saturn was back on September 27th. The second time is when it's exact is on November 28th. Let's move this chart ahead to the 28th. And we can see here that Mars is not only trining Saturn, but on Monday the 28th, the moon is moving through Aquarius, also connecting up with Saturn. And that may emphasize the Saturn side, but I always think that Mars trining Saturn is a great time to do hard work. It's a great time to organize complicated projects. It's a great time um, to actually apply that sometimes, sometimes scattered um, Mars and Gemini, or let's say sometimes scattered, how do I want to say this, Mars in sometimes scattered Gemini, um, that it's trying to Saturn actually gives it focus, gives it grounding, gives it a sense of, uh, of um, determination and causation. It makes a plan, it sticks through to it, and it does what it needs to do. Um, and that occurs on the 28th. Incidentally, the third and final Mars trine Saturn is the end of March as Mars is moving direct and out of its shadow, um, the end of March of um, 2023. So we have this, I think, what theoretically um, could be an, um, a, a rather um, positive ending of the month. Um, I mean, we'll have to see, but we also have 
Now, Mercury, I think I mentioned this earlier, um, Mercury, Venus, and the Sun making trines with Chiron, um, and that's November 24th, Mercury, um, Venus on the 25th, and then the Sun, the beginning of, um, of, um, of December. Um, and that coupled with the Mars trine Saturn, I think we have a chance to really get some work done. Now, we also have the planets moving into opposition with Mars, um, and we get the first taste of that the end of the month, and then we'll get the rest of it the beginning of December, um, or, yeah, yeah, toward the first half of December. And that is as Mercury um, on the 29th, Mercury moves exactly opposite Mars, follow, that, that's on the 29th, um, followed by Venus moving exactly opposite Mars the following day. And these are both uh, aspects of relationship. I think the cool thing here, though, is that, that Mars is still within, um, within orb of trining Saturn, and both Mercury and Venus um, are both coming through that sextile to Saturn. Um, and, and again, that sextile to Saturn um, is um, exact Mercury on the 29th, and then Venus and the Sun both on into December. So I think we have the end of a month here where we actually can get some very important things done, we can be responsible, and we are hopefully around the bend. What does this mean? I think that by the end of November, we're ready to take a sighting on where we're going rather than continuing on just looking back and figuring out where we've been. That's it for now. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's an intriguing month to me, not only because of the power of the chart on Election Day in the United States, but there's so much noise. There's so much energy going on that, that are the um, inner planets making aspects with the outer planets, but there are no real outer planet aspects. I mean, even Mars, because it's barely, barely moving, makes any aspects at all. In fact, the, you know, there, there's aspects from all of the, from, from the Sun, from Mercury, from Venus. Mars makes the square to Neptune, which is the second of three on November 19th, and the trine to Saturn, which is the second of three, it does that on November 28th, Jupiter turns direct on the 23rd, which I think is a very slow and important shift. Again, it's part of that whole sense of the Sagittarius, the energy, because remember, as Jupiter turns direct, it will move back into Aries, not until December, but again, we're moving forward. We're, we're done with this little review period that we've just had. But besides those two aspects from Mars to Neptune and Saturn, there's no aspects by any outer planets. And this is curious. It's, 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 it's important that there's no aspects from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and, or Pluto to any of the you know, other slow-moving planets. So um, this, doesn't, this doesn't mean that the events are unimportant. It just means that the focus is on the intensity of what's going on now, and it won't be until November, until December, and then on until next year, on through next year, where we get to take what happened this year and then begin to aim it into the future. Um, that's it. Again, if you want the mid-month update, go to um, patreon.com slash Rick Levine and sign up for um, the, um, the solar, no, the, the, yeah, the solar level. That's $3 a month. Um, and other than that, I'll see you all again on the 1st of December. Until then, remember to keep thinking cosmically, but acting locally. Um, more than ever, I say this all the time, but we can spend as much time as we want out there surfing the, the cosmic waves and thinking about the incredible magic and beauty of the planetary motions and so on. If we don't bring them back to Earth, down to Earth, back home, back to our family, back to our job, back to our relationships, then what's the purpose of it all? Think cosmically, act locally, and I'll see you all in December.